Ion. I see you're speaking, but you're muted. Ah, uh, now I seem to be unmuted. I hope that that's the case. Very good to have you, yes. Michael. Since you are the keynote speaker or the invited talk for this section, it would be not the same without you. So I appreciate you uh, you being here. Give me one second. We're trying to get set up here. We are recording and I will do a very quick opening. Uh, Michael, we did not coordinate me giving you an as laudable introduction as I did to uh, uh, the first talk with Eric Ekuden. So I was hoping that you could say a few words about your own, uh, about yourself as well at the beginning after I've introduced uh, uh, this, uh, this section, right? So if you could start sharing the slides. So, and then uh, sure. Michael, I'm assuming that you are sharing your slides from your end. Is that correct? Or did you send them to us? No, no, I didn't send them, so I'm sharing. No, I can no, just, that's, uh, no that's good. We'll give you the opportunity to share after I do a quick introduction. Um, so if you go into presentation mode. Yeah, um, it doesn't look the way no. it usually does here, actually. But maybe I can just share the screen and that works. Yeah, just give me a second, Michael. I will first open the session and then leave the floor to you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to uh, wish everyone uh, welcome to um, one of the three community sessions that is currently ongoing. I hope you can uh, see my slides. Um, this, uh, sorry. Yes, but that's OK. I'm not that useful, so um, you can. I hope you can at least see the slides. You might be able to see me, but I cannot see myself, so that's part of the game. When we were preparing this session, I was looking for someone who could, from an industrial perspective, uh, provide uh, an illustrative example of how companies in the software center are working with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning, and specifically how they are uh, making it real. And, and it happens so that we were, uh, in addition to several of the other software companies, also working with Scania and the group that is working on building autonomous driving solutions for Scania. And the head of that group, uh, Mikael Johansson, is now um, uh, with us and he has agreed to uh, give a presentation of about 30 minutes or so around uh, deep learning for autonomous driving, application and development flows is the um, presentation title that Michael, Michael chose. However, he explicitly said that he didn't want to do a one hour presentation and just uh, uh, share. He was really looking for uh, using that presentation as a conversation starter and use perhaps the first 30 minutes to share uh, his findings and the findings of his team from Scania and, and give all of us a bit of an overview, but to then go into a uh, conversation with everyone participating in this uh, in this session. So with that, uh, I would like to um, yield the floor to uh, to Michael. So if we stop sharing and then he Michael will share his own screen. Um, and then, uh, very good, Michael. You are already in business, I think. So yeah, we, I'm I sharing. Hope you... Sorry, I hope you Sorry? can see it. I'm already can... sharing, so I hope you can see it. Yeah, we can see your slides. And uh, with that, I would like to give Michael the floor, and uh, he will tell us about uh, deep learning for autonomous driving. Go ahead, Michael. Welcome. Thank you. Maybe before I start, can you give me some information about the audience? Uh, what kind of is it automotive people in here, or what kind of what 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 kind of audience so do I have? Basically, you have an audience from the 16 uh, companies in the uh, software center. Um, we, you are, uh, or basically, there are, I believe, representatives from almost all companies in the software center. But typically, these people have an interest in artificial intelligence more than in software engineering or in um, product management. So you can assume that there is at least a basic understanding of artificial intelligence present. But I think don't assume too much. I think it would be good if you would talk us through uh, your learning so far in in a bit of detail. Okay, thanks a lot. So, uh, 
introducing myself, start as requested here by Jan. I, uh, I'm currently head of the group called uh, AI Technologies, and uh, it's part of the autonomous uh, driving organization at Scania. We are about uh, 250, 300 people now, and then there is a sub organization who primarily focus on advanced engineering and research, and that's where, where my group is. Uh, this team has been built up since about uh, three years when, when we started this particular team. The activities for autonomous driving has been ongoing for a longer time, almost 10 years. Uh, I myself started on this particular topic about five years ago when I was in uh, I was uh, a, an expat from Scania at uh, Volkswagen in Wolfsburg in their centralized research department. So I was in the group for perception uh, back then where uh, at least in Europe, I guess it, that's when it somehow took off using deep learning for autonomous driving. I guess they started earlier in Silicon Valley and maybe in China, but in Europe, that's basically when it started, I would say. And before that, I've been also working with other kind of systems development at Scania and at other companies as well before that. So that's, that's my background. And I'll start by giving you some uh, some context first about the team. I already mentioned that we're in this uh, pre-development research uh, organization. Uh, we are 12 people now uh, and a mix of uh, master engineers and, uh, and PhDs. And we also have, have uh, a lot of contacts, uh, external contract, uh, contacts. We have industrial PhDs with, uh, with Lynn Sherping and KTH, and we have a new expat at uh, uh, at Volkswagen in, in Wolfsburg, and we have uh, an expat from the other direction from MAN, who is also part of the Volkswagen and Trotten group, who is in, in my group currently. So we have grown from basically me four, three, three, four years ago until this team today, and we are still growing. And about Scania, to give you some more background, uh, this is the the outspoken goal of Scania as a company right now to, to drive the shift towards a sustainable transport system. And apart from connectivity and electrification, autonomous is a big part of this to make the transport of people and goods as efficient as possible, which is one of the keys for sustainable uh, transports. And the, what Scania offers today is, uh, is a wide range of uh, products and services. And this is relevant for us working with autonomous driving because of course Scania doesn't want to give up any of these segments where we are present and we, we, in, in, in some aspect leaders today, which means that we from the autonomous solutions, uh, we also have to cover all of this, which is uh, a challenge in itself because driving in a, Construction area is not the same as in highway, which is not the same as in a city, of course. The final Scania background slide is this modular system that uh, Scania is, uh, is kind of famous for. We are in automotive terms, a very small company in, in terms of volumes, but still we manage to be present in all of these segments. And that's, that is thanks to our modular, modular system, which means we, we manage to have very few parts that we can assemble very modularly and still offer a, a wide range of products. And uh, I'm showing this slide because it, uh, it's also how we think in terms of our software all the way down to, to deep learning modules in our autonomous driving stack. It has to be, we have to, we, we strive to make it modular so that we can cover as much as we can. It's somehow in our in our DNA to 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 do it modularly, so to say. So that's it about the about the Scania background. And uh, so to to build a an autonomous vehicle is basically to build a virtual driver or a robot. And the the fundamentals of robotics, I guess, is this sense think act in the case of the human driver we have the human senses the human brain and and the actuators which is physical steering wheels and pedals and to make this into a virtual driver of course we have to replace the human senses with uh, with sensors like lidars radars cameras and so on the thinking has to be done by hardware and software and the activation has to be a, a base vehicle which is drive by wire and ready to be controlled uh, by the software and the electronics. And of course, to release or to deploy a, a 40 plus ton vehicle in, in the public streets is of course a, 
a safety, a challenging, uh, uh, a challenge from a safety perspective. If you go to an industry where you have robots, they are typically enclosed by gates, and if you open the gate, and everything is automatically uh, shut off. But here we really have to to cope without those measures. And why I'm, why I'm mentioning this is because in terms of the sensors, we need we need a lot of different sensors to to really cope with all possible situations. And these men, these sensors that I mentioned here have all their different strengths and weaknesses. Like lidars have a, a very good distance measurements uh, that they are limited in range compared to radar and camera, and they can be sensitive to disturbances. Radars are very robust, but they are the most sparse uh, in, in, in terms of information. The camera is very rich in information, but it's it's typically bad at distance measurement, and it's also sensitive to uh, bad light conditions, for example. So we need all of these sensors, and that is then a challenge for us because that ends up in a lot of data that we need to, to be able to deal with. And we, it's not like we have one of these sensors. We have to cover the whole 360 view with all these three different sensor modalities. So it's a lot of sensors in the end. And of course, other safety critical components like hardware and so on must all be uh, redundant. So in my team, then we uh, we basically have four different uh, areas that we cover with with the people. It's if we start from from the left here, it's uh, it's the data selection and annotation. There is uh, a few few people that from the team that spend their days working on trying to find smart methods how to select the appropriate data to add to the data sets and um, and to automate the pipelines and the processes. I will go down a bit more into details in all of these four. This is uh, first to give an overview. Then we have the actual functions the, where we develop uh, deep learning uh, or deep neural networks and, and so on to actually process uh, all the incoming data to make some sense out of it. <clears throat> The third pillar is the the development platform. So, enable uh, in order to uh, to have an efficient development, we need to have a good platform where we can uh, reuse code and uh, run deep learning jobs uh, in a, in parallel clusters in an efficient manner. How, how to uh, monitor experiments and and to have it all organized and to to retrain efficiently when new data is available and so on. And then finally, it's the onboard deployment, which is the maybe from old Scania perspective, the the most straightforward one, where we actually deploy things in the embedded systems with C plus plus and TensorT and so on. <clears throat> so first about data selection and, and annotation. As you all know, in machine learning, the data is uh, a vital part of, of your output in the end. And without robust data, we cannot build robust models. And the data quality has a, a large impact on the actual performance of the generated model in the end. And for example, in active learning, where the generated models is actually used for selecting new data to expand the data set, if we already have a bad or a skewed or a biased model, then yeah, how would this potential error then propagate in, into the future when we maybe keep selecting more uh, bad data in worst case? So it's uh, imperative to catch data problems early before they propagate through these uh, uh, loops and, uh, and, and, and affect the, the output. So these are challenges that I would just like to raise for the discussion later. What, what is the definition of high quality data? How, how can we measure it? What are suitable requirements on data? This is uh, questions that we are battling with. And uh, looking at uh, maybe differences that at least that's my observations between the academia and the industry. For us, typically, we the problem is the starting point. We need to solve a problem. So how do we go about it? And when we when we go about it with machine learning or deep learning, of course, data engineering is the most central part of the work because given that you have a decent model, tweaking the model would give you some percent in improved accuracy, but tweaking the data potentially gives you orders of magnitudes better of better results in the end. Whereas my observation, at least, that in the academia, the data is often the starting point because the PhD student typically don't want to 
run annotation projects, they want to tweak the algorithms and gain a few percentages on the benchmark leaderboards and so on. So the starting point is often the data and there are countless of papers published on functional tweaks of neural networks and so on. And those are very useful. We are very grateful for those. But we're kind of missing research on on these other questions like in active learning, which methods are more useful and, and uh, what are requirements on, on data quality and so on. A question, for example, is what about the image formats? If we use a lossy image format like JPEGs, how does that affect the, the actual output and what what would be the optimal format, for example? I, I think there is somewhat of a gap between the industry and, and academia that it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on later on in the discussion. When we collect the data, as we don't have all the answers uh, on data quality and so on, we strive for collecting data with uh, as high frame rate and as high resolution and as high quality as possible. And as I said earlier, we have a lot of sensors and this translates into a lot of data, which is a major challenge for us. How do we, in one day of so data collection driving, we generate uh, several terabytes of data. And this is a challenge then because we have to be able to transfer it from the vehicle to, to the data center for processing. We need to be able to store it. We need to be able to process it, organize it and so on. And this is a lot where our daily job actually uh, evolves around how to achieve this. And this is maybe the bigger challenge to getting data out of the vehicle is, and having and having stable system in the vehicle that actually works the full day. That's more more of a challenge than actually being able to train a neural network from, from our perspective. And then into the data selection, like in these uh, simple examples, th this first image here, obviously the network performs very well here. So, so this, uh, this sample is of low value to add to the data set, whereas this other example, obviously it's, it's not performing very well. So th the network seems to be struggling with this example. So that seems to be a, a sample of high value to add to the data set. And this is uh, our approach where we try to uh, deploy an active learning pipeline where we use this kind of output from the existing network to to pick new interesting samples to add to the data set so that we would hopefully when we add this image in the data set have it annotated and add it and retrain hopefully we can deal with this image much better in the next iteration so our data selection uh, uh, yeah method or or workflow is it's like a funnel. We have a lot of data in the beginning, the, all the raw data coming from the vehicle. And we want to basically scale it down to a, a very selected few. Maybe it's like one or one out of a thousand or one out of the two thousand that we select in the end, or, or maybe even less. And, and we need to do this, of course, in a highly automated fashion. We can't sit and do this manually. That's that's first of all, it's boring and it's uh, and probably won't have very good results in the end. Anyway. So it needs to be with with algorithms and automation. And typically in the beginning, when there's a lot of data in the beginning of the funnel, there has to be more lightweight algorithms. And as we come down further down in the selection process, we can attack it with more computationally heavy, heavy algorithms to in the end uh, just end up with these selected few most relevant and valuable sam samples. And if you remember that picture in the previous slide where we had a pretty bad performance, we could also see that poor performance in the uncertainty output of our neural network. So our first assumption was to basically just build a corner case detector by looking at the uh, uncertainty. If the uncertainty is spiking, that means the problem, the network has a problem with this sample, that means it's a valuable sample. So we'll annotate that and add to the data set. And in the next iteration, we should be able to deal with it. But it turns out with that approach, we only get very strange samples like uh, images where there's some smudge on the lens of the camera or when there is another truck maybe very far or, or maybe close to the cameras, we just see a big door or something. So, so, so that didn't really turn out well. So what we then added was more simple rules uh, on metadata. So typically here in the beginning, we would process the images to add to extract metadata and then we can query that metadata to, for example, look for 
yeah, simple rules like if we see a certain amount of other objects in the image or if we are at an intersection, if we are moving or whatever. And those in combination with, uh, with uncertainty is what we are using at the moment. And again, it's it's a lot about the pipeline. We need to be able to automatically, when new when new data hits the server, we automatically classify all the data with our neural networks to add more metadata. We populate the database, and we can use that database for for writing queries in an efficient manner. And we can also then experiment with the logics and the rules on which data to select. So after we are done with our uh, data selection and we have our samples that we want to uh, add for annotation. We, we at least at Scana don't do our own annotation. We use suppliers for this, so we have to send them the data in some way. And we have uh, set up a, uh, a pipeline where we basically uh, publish the data in uh, an S3 bucket, which they can access. First, we anonymize the image because of GDPR reasons. We blur license plates and and faces that we find in the images and remove timestamps and so on from from the images to make them as uh, anonymous as possible. We we make the data available for the annotation supplier. They annotate it and then we have an additional supplier who's doing QA for us and then they iterate among themselves a couple of rounds and then finally it's sent back to us. And when it's back in that uh, receiving bucket, we automatically launch a bunch of scripts to, to process the annotation. So, for example, we annotate more classes than we actually use at the moment, because for some cl classes they are so rare, so it doesn't make sense to actually try to train a network for them. So then we just maybe discard them or we maybe merge multiple classes into one class that we currently use in our existing version of the network. And we also maybe don't, we, we do the annotations in full resolution to get the best quality of the annotation, but currently we process the images in, in real time in lower resolution because of yeah, computational uh, resources uh, reasons. So those kind of uh, processing is automatically triggered when new annotations is available and then it's added to the existing data set and ready for, for training and, and so on. So then we're on to the functions, the functional part, what we do. And this is one example that you probably have seen before. It's uh, a popular common in image processing, semantic segmentation. Uh, so we classify each pixel in the image according to our predefined set of classes, as you see in the example here. And uh, in the bottom image, we also have a uh, heat map which represents the uncertainty of the classification. So here blue means certain and green means more uncertain and red means very uncertain, but I don't think we have any red in this particular example. So of course it's very important to have the uncertainty when we put when we deploy this into an autonomous driving software stack. We can't just give the output as is. We also need to uh, send along some certainty. So in the fusion of different uh, sensor uh, or uh, information sources, uh, fusion algorithms needs to know which information source to trust the mo most in each particular uh, moment. Uh, the upside with, or a good thing with semantic segmentation is that it, it's very free in its form. It can represent any shape, uh, more or less. We can use it both for objects and for uh, uh, like surfaces and other uh, static features in the environment. That this makes it suitable for, uh, for fusion uh, with LiDAR to add uh, accurate depth information or distance information. Uh, this particular example does not provide an instance uh, information. So if we have, for example, a whole, like a cluster of pedestrians who are kind of occluding each other, we don't really know if it's uh, one very large human or if it's uh, three small ones. Uh, but there are also instance segmentation techniques and so on, which uh, we are also starting with, but I don't have an example of that today. Then moving on to bounding box regression, which is uh, a different uh, technique to identify different uh, interesting objects in the scene. So here we just define the objects and classify the class with the, with the bounding box instead. And uh, the positive things uh, of this technique compared to semantic segmentation is that we do get the, the instance uh, information. There's a unique box for each unique object in the scene. Uh, and it's also suitable for uh, for doing tracking. So 
we we can do tracking, uh, for example, with uh, with Kalman filters and with optical flow and with visual features, which is more of a deep learning based technique. So in the convolutional neural network, taking the original image of this little box a few convolutions down or further down in the in the backbone of the network, we can extract some feature vector which represents like a fingerprint of the object. And then we can use that fingerprint in the next frame to match a correspondent correspondent feature vector of the same object. So then we can use that visual feature to find the object in the next frame and use that for tracking. And if we do a combination of Kalman filter and these visual features, we yeah, we would have a better tracking than tracker than Kalman filter only, which is, I guess, the most straightforward approach. And then depth estimation. So finding these features, bounding boxes and so on in image space doesn't really have, doesn't really help our uh, motion planner because they can't drive in, in an image space. They need to drive in the real world, in the 3D world. So we need to transform a certain pixel into a certain distance. And one way of doing it is using a, a monocular uh, depth estimation, monocular camera depth estimation neural network. And personally, I like this approach very much because it's an elegant way of using self-supervised learning. So we don't have to have these annotations. And in this uh, particular example, it, it wouldn't even be possible to create annotations. A human cannot annotate the distance to a, to a certain object in a picture. In that case, we would have to maybe rely on, on LiDAR to back project the LiDAR to the pixels, but the LiDAR is much more sparse than the, than the camera. So we would we'd only have ground truth for certain pixels. We wouldn't be able to achieve as high accuracy as we would like. But formulating the problem as a sort of supervised learning problem, we can basically learn the depth implicitly by learning a proxy task. So the ground truth in this case is the next image in, in a sequence. So we have a video or a sequence of images and the learning task is to reconstruct the next image in the sequence. And to do that, we, we can minimize the photometric loss between these two images. And for that, we need to know the pose of the camera, how it moved from one frame to the other, and we need to, to know the depth. So by, by learning this task, by learning how to recreate the next image, we implicitly learn the depth. And after the learning is complete, we can extract the depth network and we can deploy that standalone uh, in real time. And then we have our depth estimation as we are after. So to give an overview of all the functions, and now we're back to the modular approach. We could do things end to end, like we could take a camera image and we can produce a 3D bounding box with depth all in one step. But the downside of this is that we would not be able to reuse that information uh, for different purposes. Like if we look at the output here, we, we can have a camera only output, maybe at le very long ranges, like uh, depending on your lens configuration, a camera can see more than a thousand meters, which is far out of range for LIDARs or radars. Or if the other sensor for whatever reason is not working and we are in some degraded mode where only camera is available, it's good to have a camera only pipeline. And all the same with other sensors, it's good to have a cam or a LiDAR only and a radar only pipeline. Or if the LiDAR is out of range, but the camera and radar is in range, then we can have a, a camera radar fusion or a camera LiDAR fusion. Oh, yeah, you get the idea. We, we want to have all possible combinations. And by doing it modularly, where we have these uh, different uh, examples that I showed of uh, image processing uh, modules, we can combine them in different ways to create this uh, diverse output. And it also gave us the chance to add some sanity checks that uh, if the camera says there is uh, an object somewhere, then the radar can maybe confirm that instead of if you just do it end to end, there is no way really of, of checking how, if, how uh, if it really makes sense, if it's really true. And then I have hopefully a video that you hopefully can see about an example of uh, LiDAR and camera fusion. So here what you see is uh, uh, the LIDARs are back projected to the camera image and the semantic segmentation information is inherited to the corresponding LIDAR point. So here we have very good depth 
from, from the LiDAR, which that sensor does very well. And we also have the classification information from the camera, which this sensor does very well. So we have the best of both sensors, which gives us a classified point cloud. So the colors here corresponds to different classes, like green is uh, uh, road or drivable surface, and the purple is car, and, and so on. So I'll continue to the next example where we have camera and radar fusion. This is just the screen screen uh, screen dumps. That's why it's not so uh, uh, what do you say? Well prepared to to look beautiful. So so all these clusters that you see, those are the radar detections. That also gives you an impression of what what to expect from a radar. It's not very easy to work with. And then you have some some lines which are maybe not so easy to see. But you have a little purple line here. This is the the camera output. And as you can see, it's it's a pretty good estimation. The correspondence between the, that little line and the green box. The green box is from the radar, and the purple line is from the camera. And the azimuth angle is very accurate between the radar and the camera, but the distance estimation for the camera was very poor. So that's that's how we could see that radar and camera together could give you good information. Okay, so that was it about the functions, and then on to the development platform. <clears throat> so uh, it's it's important. To, to have this as uh, efficient as possible. And our goal is to, to more or less make it fully automated. Once we have kind of set everything up and we are in some development phase where we want to stay. So in a data-driven uh, development methodology, you want to iterate, add data in this active learning manner to improve your network, monitor that your network actually gets improved by the new data and then use the new network to select new samples and then keep running this uh, loop until we have iterated enough times to, to be ready for production, basically. And then automation and pipelines again is very important. So ideally it should be more or less fully automated. I already explained when what happens in our annotation management pipeline when, when we get new annotations that we publish the data, we get the data back. Everything is by script automated to be ready for retraining, adding the new data in the, in the data set. But then the retraining should also be automated. So when new data is available, we should retrain our networks. We should run all checks and uh, uh, and tests to to verify that the network actually has improved. We should update our KPIs and look at our our burn down charts to see that we actually are improving. Add the the new network into the complete AV stack and rerun all those tests, and then finally redeploy to the vehicle to to see that yeah that we are actually are improving. Uh, and and this is basically then. A development pipeline that we are building with a bunch of tools and uh, and monitor uh, plugins and so on to monitor experiments and to see that the processes are running as they should and with some scalability so that we don't have to wait for two weeks because the one gpu is not more powerful but to have a parallel cluster where we can run things much more efficiently and this is uh, where we spend a lot of our work, not so much tweaking the neural networks, but rather building these pipelines. And finally, the deployment to the vehicle. This is an overview of simple overview. So we do the, the development of the neural networks in, in Python using TensorFlow and PyTorch, for example. Once the training is done and we're happy with the output, we uh, translate the, the output to own an X. I'm not sure, I think you probably are aware of it, but it's a, an open, what's called de facto standard today, I would say. So uh, all the different uh, uh, deep learning frameworks can output to own an X, and all inference frameworks that we run on the embedded system can can take the own an X as input. So it's a suitable format to to use. So we translate to own an X. And then we translate again for the target system to, in our case, we use uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and then we use TensorRT for the actual uh, real-time inference. And we write our modules with C++ and use the TensorRT C++ API to, to load the model and to feed the image to the model and to run the inference. 
And there are some translation steps here. So we have to make sure that the model isn't uh, lost in translation. We have to verify that the, the final tensor RT model actually behaves the same as the original PyTorch or TensorFlow model that we trained in the beginning. Uh, to mention about our target hardware, we uh, we actually started out on this uh, drive uh, system from, from NVIDIA. They, it's like a I guess you could say pre-development or research uh, system, which is uh, their solution to an automotive uh, system to deploy neural networks, basically. Uh, we started out on that system with the uh, cameras connected directly to it, but it was a little bit unflexible to work with. So we've actually moved away from that currently to a regular PC with the, with the GPU so that we can access the the core libraries more directly without uh, higher level APIs. This makes things a lot easier and experiments is much faster basically. And we get the higher performance. But we still use NVIDIA boards to, to communicate with the cameras. And the way we did it is we have one application instance for each camera stream and then we run, we configure which uh, neural networks we want to run for that particular camera and then yeah, we run one instance per camera stream. And uh, we do all we can to minimize the computational time. For example, in the training phase, we do network pruning to remove, uh, I don't know if you're probably you're familiar with the concept, but we can, uh, in training, we can reduce maybe as much as 80% of the parameters in the network with uh, maintained accuracy to reduce the computational time. And also in the tensor T framework is does a quantization. For example, instead of using float 32s for, for all the parameters, we could go down all the way to int eights. And I guess they also do other things to, um, to really use their own hardware in an optimal fashion. So by doing this, we save a lot of computational time compared to running it in, in the native frameworks. And yeah, and also we do things like uh, make sure to do JPEG uh, encoding or decoding with the GPU and so on, all we can. And I think to uh, to summarize it, I would, to, to end, I would end with a question. So AI first or AI last? As you know, uh, AI has a lot of upsides like the functional performance and the scalability. You just add more data and then you can deal with a new scenario. But it also has some downside. The black box nature of a neural network, it's hard to analyze and predict. It's often very overconfident and it's computationally expensive. So when should we then, in our case of autonomous driving, when should we use AI? Should it, for example, should the conclusion be to only use it when necessary, when all other methods are clearly inferior? Is that where we should use it? Or, or should we only use it in combination with other methods, rule-based or analytical, to verify the output? Or should we reason like we have to solve all these downsides anyway, so we might as well just go for AI first instead. I'm not sure. I think when we started out, it was rather the, the first two, but I don't know where we, where the trends are going and maybe maybe it would end up with the last one of these conclusions if we are really to, to be able to make autonomous driving on, on a larger scale in the end. So that was what I had for you. I hope it's what you expected. If you I don't know if you want to go to questions or discussion. Over to you, Jan, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Mikael. That was awesome. Thank you, so uh, really insightful and very interesting. And I really appreciate you uh, also raising the question at the end. I mean, when should we use AI? Should, it be, should we be very reactive as a method of last resort or should we try to push everything? So I, I hope you can see you're getting a few applause uh, claps in the, uh, in the chat or on the screen, so thank you very much. So if you stop sharing your screen, Michael, yeah, very good. I was thinking that we would um, uh, basically first ask, give people the opportunity to ask you some questions that they might have. And I must say, I am in Teams, I cannot, I think I can see the chat. So you can either raise your hand uh, or you can uh, uh, put a question in the chat. And I can see that someone by the name of MU has a question, so I don't know who MU is. Uh, it's Maria. Okay. Yes. Hi, Maria. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your camera is uh, off, by the way. It's really dark. If you could turn your camera on, Michael can see you, if you feel like you it. Can you see me now? No, now it's. 
now we can see. I can see yes. Okay, thanks a lot for the presentation. I really enjoyed. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the they are quite a bit te technical. Um, uh, according to your opinion, uh, do you think that more data will actually solve the problem? Uh, so, I mean, the question is that, uh, okay, if we assume that this uh, deep learning and neural networks uh, will make this self-driving self, yeah? So, it, it seems like that we just need to, to feed more data to consider as more examples as uh, we could, let's say, imagine. Or let's say something else is needed, some abstractions or symbolism or like symbolic AI. And uh, the, the second question, maybe it should be the first one, uh, like you personally and in Saab, how you will define an AI system and how you test that it's really AI, that it's not like, a, I don't know, infinite loops of if and then, so it's not really intelligence. So what is the definition according to you? Okay, first start with the first question. Uh, I think for, first of all, we, we sure don't have all the answers. This is there's a reason why this work is in the research organization, the research part of the of our company. Uh, I think more data is the more data, the better the output. If it will be enough, then that that for sure I'm not sure of. One thing to to think about is that we especially with commercial vehicles, it's it's easier for us to, to limit the operational design domain or the ODD as we call it. So we, we don't plan to be able to launch anywhere. We, we plan mm. to maybe launch for one particular stretch of highway between two cities in Europe, for example. So it's easier to verify that we have enough data to cover that stretch than to cover the whole world. Uh, and on top of that, I'm convinced that we need some kind of really reliable uncertainty output alongside with the neural network uh, uh, estimations. We need to be able to say right now, I just don't know what I'm doing. So I, I have no idea. And you have to rely on other sensors for, for this particular uh, event. If that answers the question, the first question. Yeah. For the second question, yeah, so I was maybe personally a bit annoyed how uh, uh, term AI was used, but I just ex accepted that everybody says AI and they mean deep learning. So that's basically what mm. I uh, also mean. And uh, we don't really think so much about the definitions of AI. Uh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria, was that an answer to your questions? I have yes, thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Good. We'll put you, if you have more questions, go to the back of the queue and we'll let you in at a later point. But the next person I wanted to re leave, uh, ask to come in is uh, Ivica Cienkovic, and then after that I was thinking Jesper, and then for those of you that do not know Ivica, he is actually the director of the Chalmers AI, uh, AI Research Center. So Ivica, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Very, very nice uh, uh, presentation of the entire process. Uh, uh, actually, I have many questions, but let, let me ask one. Uh, so, in your uh, uh, development process, uh, you, you know, in your products, your cars, you have also other part of software which is not AI, and you also have development process of that, which is, uh, you know, continuous change, continuous integration. So, how do you integrate uh, your process with the uh, uh, overall process of uh, software development or product development? Yeah, so, uh, so when, when we have uh, a new version of our, let's yeah, depends on the process is large and there is like many, there's more exploratory work and maybe more, uh, more, more mature work. But let's say we, we do have, uh, so first we work like finding the concepts and then it's very exploratory, like trying different concepts and trying different fusion uh, methods uh, together with other teams and maybe focus more on that. And once we found a concept and maybe say, okay, so let's go into more of a product with this concept. Then our our network is basically published on, uh, yeah, somewhere on some system with, and then it's picked up by our CI loop uh, to be integrated into the complete software product. And, uh, and in that loop, yeah, I'm, I'm describing the ideal situation now, not necessarily how it actually is, 
at our organization currently. But then it will be part of all the regression tests and all the processes for actually making a release. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we publish our uh, release, we run our own tests to make sure that like the modular test or the unit test where we see that for the classes that we have, we have actually an improvement now with this network. Then we 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 make our release and then it's integrated uh, with the rest of the product and then they do all their tests. And if we have a, a perception algorithm, then the perception as a whole should improve. And uh, once we are a bit more mature and we know what we're looking for, maybe we know that, yeah, we have problems with pedestrians in occluded areas. So maybe that's what we focus on and then we can tailor tests towards that, for example. So uh, before our output, our new network is released into an actual vehicle, it also undergoes all the regular testing of the of the system as a whole. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ivica. Uh, I think the next person is Jesper Derehawk from Ericsson, but Jesper, correct? Yeah, hi, thank you for a good talk. Uh, this question is almost philosoph philosophical in nature, I would say, but I usually ask it to all autonomous drive people, is this perception of end-to-end -end learning versus pretty much every company, autonomous drive company today does these uh, decentralized solutions, right? Where you uh, kind of <clears throat> separate vision functions from path planning, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I'm also thinking, like in the long-term perspective in terms of end-to-end -end versus these this, uh, distributed learning type approach to it uh, is that i mean if you do let's say rule-based or symbolic variations in terms of the of the decision making part if if you have that you must have a, a perfect representation of the entire world so that puts a lot of pressure on all the kind of uh, all the function implementations that they need to be super, super good <clears throat> in, in terms of what they're doing. But have you considered this kind of balance between end-to-end -end learning versus these decentralized variations where you need to be perfect in every way uh, and also spend a lot of effort in terms of the, in, in terms of the decision uh, part? Um, I mean, all autonomous drive companies kind of don't like the end-to-end -end approach, but what's, what's your view on it? Uh, this is basically my last question. Uh, should should we go AI first or, or AI last? Uh, I guess what you're describing is more or less in the sense that uh, I would say there's more or less a consensus that the first versions that different companies, the leaders, startups and so on are pursuing is rather the, the not end-to-end. Um, my, my comment is more, uh, for me, it feels like there is a lack of research in terms of end-to-end -end solutions, whether it being based on reinforcement learning or something else doesn't really yeah. matter. But pretty much everybody seems to be going in the same direction. Yeah, I agree that automotive companies and uh, yeah, also the, the IT companies, Waymo and so on, who are more going for production, I agree they are not going end to end, but I don't know about lack of research. I think the, the computer vision institutions are quite active, I would say, in, in end to end, because as a research topics, this is probably very exciting. So I think research is being done, um, but it's not mature, or if we are to pick the most likely approach to actually reach a product in any time soon, then probably the non end to end approach is, seems more uh, likely. Uh, All right. yeah. and, and also as a final comment, the, the perception doesn't have to be perfect. If we do manage to generate reliable uncertainties, then we have a probabilistic representation of the environment that the motion planner can use. So it doesn't have to know exactly the truth. It needs to know different probabilities. And then when you plan your trajectories, you can, you can, your cost function basically can take into account what the probabilities. So it, it can still work without having a perfect representation. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you, Jesper. Uh, to be honest, because of the setup we have here, it's a bit hard for me to see who has their hand up, but I did think I saw Aizwaria uh, wanting to ask a question. Yes, Jan. Can uh, you share your video as well so we can see you? Yeah, sure. 
I hope you can see me now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Michael, for an interesting presentation. So it was really good to see that there are uh, data quality issues and everything that is being discussed and being researched in industries. So uh, I have a question regarding uh, the data selection method that you have showed. I was wondering if you are storing the raw data before this data selection process. So the data that is collected directly from the census, are you storing it somewhere before you do this data selection process? Yes, so the data selection happens in the data center. So the first step is to, to transfer all the raw data to the data center, and then we do our data selection. So yeah, we store the raw data. Okay, and what about this data selection? Or, or actually, depends on what you mean by raw. We don't, if you take the camera, it's a serial interface to the, the, to the deserializer. We don't store that kind of raw data. Okay, so, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I understand. So maybe and the answer is no then. Yeah. Uh, and what about this data selection process? Is it like completely automated or is it something called rule based or something? Or is it an AI based data selection approach that you use now? Both. It's both. Okay. Uh, so yeah. it's hybrid. Yeah, it's hybrid. Okay. That's, that's what I meant when we did. So I guess AI only would, would be this uh, uncertainty scoring, which would just give us strange samples. So, as of now, we found that the combination works best for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what happens if there is some data shift or like uh, if the data distribution changes or say, for instance, if the uh, data format uh, is changed, will this data selection process still be able to process that kind of data? I think so. It, it seems that we already have uh, our data sets comes from multiple sources from uh, from multiple cameras and multiple vehicles setups and so on. So uh, it seems to be able to handle it. Yeah. But this is also a lot of work in progress. It's not like we have the answer and we just have to run our loop until we're done. This is a lot of uh, research that remains for us as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have one last question. Go ahead, Ashwarya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, could you please tell me uh, what are the most uh, three uh, or uh, high priority data quality challenges that you have encountered? I guess there will be so many like inconsistency in validity and a lot of other challenges would be there, but I would want to ask you what are the top three challenges? The top three, yeah, maybe. I don't know if it's the right order, but I would say annotation consistency is one. Okay, yeah, okay. And uh, this is touching upon a comment from earlier. When we don't do it end to end, we kind of influence. We, we select as you, we specify which are the relevant classes, but are they really the relevant classes? Uh -huh. That's maybe related to data. And uh, then also which samples to actually select. Are we selecting the right samples, or are we get, are we getting enough variety? And is that right representative? Like we have an, a huge overrepresentation of cars among our classes compared to uh, animals, which is like just a fraction. So it's mm -hmm. a, a very skewed data data set, and it's hard to to balance it. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, those were the best. So I I must uh, commend commend Aishwarya for her ability to hijack a session for her own research activities and interviews, but uh, sorry, Aishwarya, I couldn't resist. But I mean, these are very relevant topics that we are actually uh, working on, and Aishwarya is looking a lot into data pipelines and data quality, hence, hence the questions that she was uh, asking, especially since you confront, Michael, what uh, we already suspected, that coming up with the machine learning model is not the hardest part of the problem. It is actually getting high quality data in place and the end to end pipeline, which is the tricky part. Thank you, Aishwarya. Uh, I'm sure you have more questions, but you know, Michael is still yeah. part of Software Center, so we'll uh, have other ways of reaching out to him. There is a question from Austria. So, Gerald Czech was, had a question as well. So, go ahead, Gerald. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the amazing insights. Uh, my question is you mentioned that you uh, have a lot of work to do with. with, with designing all these pipelines and, and rearranging. Where do you see uh, possibilities for automation? Where do you can parts of, of this work, can it be automatic by, as in normal software means, or, or even by AI, thinking of going towards automatic machine learning? 
yeah, the things that I just uh, talked about today, my vision is that it's more or less completely automated. And by automated, I mean by yeah, traditional software. It's when we get new data on the server, then a script would trigger to do something, which then triggers the next strip, script and the next and, and so on. So the part of the process that is not automated is the annotation. So that's side activity, but but going from selecting data into deploying a new version of the network, that should more or less be fully automated. Maybe we need to add some review stages along the way, but it should be very highly automated. OK, thank you. We are starting to run out of time and Michael, the discussion bit became a little bit more of a question answer bit. I hope that that's OK. Um, I think there is a person, uh, the abbreviation is AM. I don't know who AM is, but you have your hand raised. I think it's Asvaria who still have her hand Oh, up. Asvaria still has her, uh, has her hand up. Okay, good. Um, Michael, I want to, before we wrap up, let me ask you or give you my perspective on the question you raised in the last presentation. Then you can tell me whether I'm completely off or whether you feel that we're onto something. I believe that the future class of systems will be designed in such a way that they will experiment with their own behavior with the intent of getting better over time. A little bit along the lines of um, the monocular uh, depth estimation that we, we were discussing. And for me, that would basically mean, going back to the question at the end of your talk, that we need to do as much in AI as possible because only when it is mapped to a machine learning or deep learning model with some reinforcement learning or and some federated learning around it, can you actually achieve that state? Um, is that a fair viewpoint or do you feel that I'm somewhere missing some of the industrial realities that you're fighting with on a day-to-day -day basis? No, I, I don't really have an answer. That's why I raised the question, but I, yeah. uh, I, I think I, I think I agree, but maybe it's we need to add the timing perspective. If we want to deploy a product as soon as possible, maybe we're not really there yet, but in the end, especially if we talk about higher level of automation where it's not just between two cities on a highway where it's more general i right. i agree i think it needs to be much more ai centric yeah good now at the uh, where it's 12 o'clock so we need to wrap this up uh, michael you may not have gotten as many answers out of it as you as you had hoped but at least you got a lot of questions out of it from the audience and the participants i wanted to really thank you for taking the time to uh, give uh, share with us how scania is working with uh, uh, autonomous drive and the AI solutions around it, or maybe we should use uh, neural network solutions around it because the AI is a bit of an overloaded term if you want. Um, we are going as a token of our appreciation, send you also one of our software center hoodies. So we'll be oh. in, uh, in touch about that. I hope uh, uh, you appreciate it and proudly wear it all around uh, the Scania premises because we of course need to ha have our marketing done there too. Uh, but really, I really appreciate you taking the time preparing such an insightful and uh, engaging presentation that clearly got the audience uh, very much engaged. And with that, I would like to thank you, Michael. And for everyone in this track, we are now breaking for lunch and we will be back in a new set of breakout sessions at one o'clock so have a great lunch everyone and we'll see you in one of the breakout sessions at one and for those of you that are on the well you're probably not on youtube because otherwise you wouldn't be hearing this but at 5 15 15 we have the closing keynote by sara mazur which i really think is something that you don't want to miss so with that thank you all very much for attending michael once again thank you for the presentation and i look forward to seeing many of you at the one o'clock session in a the ai engineering theme. Thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.